Bring, bring, bring. Hello? Gents, it's Marisa. I've got a new case for you to crack. Oh no, what's the matter? We got a perp we need you to look into. Can you, uh, can you dig in a little bit uh, to some igneous rocks for us? Absolutely, let's get right into it. Sounds good, uh, talk to you later. Oh, hey, look, you're still there. Oh, hey, Marisa. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? Doing good. Um, enjoying this lovely, um, these igneous rocks forming right behind us. Yeah, it looks like you guys are in some tumultuous situations right now. Like, um, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for all of you joining us at home, welcome. Uh, this is our weekly rock and pop up. My name's Marisa. We've got with us Graham and Gavin, the geology gents, and um, they're gonna give us a presentation today. And um, as we go through, please feel free to write questions in the comments and we will ask them of Gavin and Graham. Uh, we do have some rocks to ID at the end of the presentation as well. And if you have rocks that you would like to submit, um, you are always welcome to do that. You can uh, leave them, leave pictures in the event, the Facebook event, or send them to us some other way. Um, so, but without further ado, let's dig into igneous rocks, gents. That's great. All right. Okay. So, as you asked, we are giving the background story on igneous rocks. And so, to, to sort of warm ourselves up to getting into the adventure of the igneous rock, um, we, we put up a, a, a picture that we've shown a couple times before. No, not me and, and Gavin looking, dashing in our inspector's caps and, and looking at a rock. But on the other side of the screen, there's, um, there's a, a very iconic uh, mountain in California that's made of a very iconic rock. Gavin, can you tell us what that is? Ah, uh, yes, iconic indeed, Graham. This is a rock we've talked about a few times on this podcast here. Um, these are the granites from Yosemite. Can't miss them. Some of the most just coolest rocks I've seen. That's right. And so these things are forming. We talk about igneous rocks. And so uh, my computer wants to wait. There we go. So igneous rocks. Gavin, give us, give us the lowdown on how an igneous rock forms. Okay. So generally igneous rocks come out of melted rock, right? You melt, melt rock, you make igneous rocks, but it's not so straightforward. There are some different flavors of igneous rocks. And so the two general types of igneous rocks we have are extrusive and intrusive. And so when we say extrusive and intrusive, that implies a process. One really cool thing about igneous rocks is that just by looking at them, you can learn a lot about the, their whole background. So this is a good rock to do a background check on. So what process does ext extrusive and intrusive imply, Graham? Oh, that's great. So extrusive and intrusive, those are actually really helpful words. They mean where they formed relative to the, in, the, the earth itself. So intrusive, that keyword being in, means it forms inside the earth. It's forming underground. And so that means it's forming from magma. Then if that magma gets above ground, uh, it becomes lava and that's formed and that cools to form an extrusive igneous rock. Um, and that X part is really key. Think exit. It's exiting the earth and cooling out there. And I can't resist here. This is a great opportunity to bring a little bit of Latin into um, how we get the names for these rocks. So igneous comes from the um, Latin for fire. And even when we talk about volcanic rocks versus plutonic rocks, there's some Latin being thrown in there. Vulcan um, is the Roman name for the Greek god of fire who lived in Mount Etna and had a blacksmith forge there. And Pluto is the name for ha the Greek Hades, who's the god of the underworld. And so Vulcan is forming these, these hot rocks on the surface and Pluto is deep inside the earth forming our plutonic rocks. So those are you know, a couple different ways to help keep them straight, but lava is X out on the surface and magma is in intrusive under the surface. So, uh, so we've, we've covered this in, in pretty good detail by now. So what do you say we get to the rocks themselves? How do we recognize this in the rocks? I'd love to get to the rocks, Graham. Okay. So I see you, you've circled on the left schematic here, the rocks that are forming inside the earth. Those are the intrusive rocks. And so 
we have one of our favorites, favorites, Granite, and another one called Gabbro here. And what you can notice are some big crystals, huh, Graham? These are, these are some big crystals. And you like to use an analogy for those big crystals, like they're an art form, right? Oh, they're just like a fantastic work of art. And Gavin, can you rush art? You cannot rush art. You cannot rush perfection, Graham. <laughs> That's right. So these big crystals take a long time to form. We're building a, a beautiful work of art. We're aging a fine wine, so to speak. Okay. And so that's taking them a long time to cool deep underground. So how, so if things are cooling slowly underground, how are they cooling up on the surface? Well, you might, you might be able to imagine that if things are underneath the ground, they stay they're, they stay hot for longer. But if they're coming out of the top of the volcano, the surface of the earth is much colder. And so that means that they're gonna cool way quicker. And so instead of having those nice, beautiful, large interlocking crystals, you can't even really see the crystals on these rocks, right, Graham? That's right. And so uh, we should note here that rhyolite is made out of exactly the same stuff as a granite and basalt is made out of exactly the same stuff as a gabbro, just right here. But what's different about these is the crystals are way smaller, so small that we can't even see them with our naked eyes. Wait, so you mean to tell me that these two rocks are made of the same exact stuff as the last two, Graham? You can bet your boots on it, Gavin. Huh, okay, but, but so that means that just by looking at the texture, we can tell something about how they formed and where. That's pretty cool, huh? That is cool. And that's one of the nice things about igneous rocks. They, they help us out when it comes to where exactly they're forming. Um, but I wonder if we start with big crystals, if we cool slowly and we go to small crystals so small we can't see them if we cool quickly out of the surface, what happens? Is it, or I guess I should ask, is it possible that we just can't even form a crystal at all? Fantastic question, Graham. And you know, I think our audience might even know the answer to this because this is one of the most popular rocks to bring to the gents in the rock and pop-ups in person. This is called obsidian. It is also an igneous rock, but this, this obsidian forms when you cool melted rock so quickly that it doesn't form any crystals at all. It literally fuses into a glass. You're talking like the same sort of glass that we make bottles and glasses and and plates and things from sometimes? Same stuff, Graham. And so you can kind of see features of the obsidian, especially on this picture that make you think of glass, right? Oh, are you talking about that sort of, that sort of scooped, almost circular looking place where it got chipped? That's right, that's right. We call that conchoidal fracture. And that is the geologist jargon for saying something that breaks like glass does. And so, you might think that, you might notice that a lot of artifacts, archeological artifacts are made of obsidian and that's because it breaks naturally on these, in these shard-like patterns, just like if you broke glass at home. Oh, that's great. So it's like, a, it's just an awesome natural material for, for folks to make sharp tools out of. That's Gosh, right. Volcanoes are great. They give us such great things. That's right. Okay, so we've now talked about these different sorts of crystal sizes to recognize where a rock formed. But if we're saying that rhyolite and basalt are forming the same way, or granite and gabbro are forming the same way, they're made out of different stuff. So how do we make that happen? Uh, okay, so I want the audience to think back two weeks ago when we talked about what rocks are made of. And so the building blocks of rocks, as we learned, are minerals. And so we just cannot avoid talking about minerals when we're talking about identifying igneous rocks, right, Graham? That's right. And minerals are, they're super important. They're tricky, but they're very, very important. That's right. And so we oftentimes say that color is not a good indicator of what a mineral is, right? Because the same mineral can oftentimes come in all different colors. But Sometimes when we're talking about igneous rocks specifically, that's not the case and we can use color, right, Graham? Can you take us through that? Yeah, that's right. With igneous rocks, we can kind of let our guard down because there's a really general trend um, of just minerals being light in color or dark in color. And certainly like in the case of this granite, we see some dark minerals, but if I were to hold up that chunk of granite and that chunk of gabbro 
And I said, which one was lighter? I think just about everyone would point to that granite. And that's because there are these lighter minerals that we call felsic minerals um, that are things like quartz, feldspar, micas. They tend to be a lot shinier. They tend to be a lot lighter in color. They're clear to white to sort of a light gray to sometimes a creamy or reddish color. Um, and those are things that are going to, that are forming our granites and our rhyolites, things like that. Oh, how about those dark minerals making up the gabbro and the basalt, Gab? Okay, so you said that the light minerals are felsic. So That's they're right. sort of less dense. The dark minerals are called mafic. Those are, those are more dense, darker minerals, and they form sort of the, these blacker sort of basalts, gabbros, rocks like that. Okay, very cool. So, so light minerals make a light rock, dark heavy minerals make a darker and heavier rock. This is good. And so there's got to be some process that's making these minerals different, right? I don't think they're just coming out by random. And if I think back to my, my first classes in geology, I was told, and I am pretty confident in this, that most magmas start out pretty close to a basalt and gabbro in composition. So, so when we see things like basalts uh, that, are, that are erupting right at the surface, like in these volcanoes behind us, that must mean they're getting out, out pretty quick, right? There's no, there's no opportunity for them to change too much. That's right. If you melt the crust, most of the time, you're going to start off with the same composition. And if you melt the crust and then you eject that, that melted rock out really quickly, it's not going to change at all. So Graham, oh. how does it change? So this is where we get the chance to change, and that's by giving it time, giving it time for that magma chamber to slowly cool. And we know these things sometimes take a while to cool because we have rocks like gabbros and granites that have those great, big, wonderful crystals in them. And so what's important, or the main point, is that these darker minerals, they form at hotter temperatures, right? So we can think about forming these crystals just like freezing water right? The thing is, is water just forms all one type of ice, right? But when we're forming these minerals, these darker minerals, those are going to freeze in that magma first. And so they're going to come out of the, out of the fluid, the liquid rock, and they're, they're going to form solids, they're going to be heavy, and so those rocks are going to sink down to the bottom of that magma chamber. So once we start pulling those out of the magma, does that change our magma, Gavin? Yeah, that's exactly right. So as you said, you're pulling these out, they're sinking to the bottom, all of those mafic, denser, darker rock minerals. But what you're left with is a, a melt, the stuff that stayed in the melt as the magma is cooling, that's the lighter, sort of more felsic stuff. So you're left with a rocks that are forming that are going to be lighter in color. But what about these exceptions to the rules, Graham? We have some rocks here on the right side. What, why'd you put those there? Ooh, so that is really a lovely mineral in my opinion. That's plagioclase feldspar. It's closely related to this, this um, orthoclase feldspar, pretty similar mineral, but what's really neat about it is that it forms at all these temperatures. The exact chemistry of it will change a little bit from a hot magma to a cooler magma, but you're gonna be able to form plagioclase feldspar across all sorts of temperatures. And so when we re recall that, when we think back to that gabbro, there are little light bits in there and that's making it, uh, that's that plagioclase that's giving it that light color. Hmm. So it seems like we have uh, sort of a, a mechanism now, right? We have a story to form our igneous rocks by. That's right. And so we can, the whole point of this, right, is to be able to identify igneous rocks. And so if you know what the textures mean, you'll be able to identify not only the rock type, but where it's formed and how it's formed. And so I like what you did here, Graham. You put some, you put our rocks that we started with on the schematic. And so now we can identify that gabbro as a large crystal rock. So that means it's intrusive. It formed in a magma chamber beneath the Earth's surface. It's really dark, so it's probably made of mafic minerals. And so that implies that a, the, the process that made a gabbro. What about the uh, granite, Graham? 
Yeah, so that that magma, once all those gabbro-y things come out of there and sink to the bottom of it, we're left with a really felsic magma. And that's going to start forming a granite, and that's going to cool slowly to form a granite. But what happens when some of that really felsic magma sneaks its way up out the vent of this volcano and turns into felsic lava? Well, we get rhyolite, and that sort of is one of the places where we started. Granite and rhyolite are the same thing. And mm -hmm. that's because exactly what you said, when you have a felsic melt that becomes extrusive, it comes out of the top of the volcano, it turns into rhyolite. Right. And I could have even thrown that that obsidian on here as this, this volcanic bomb that's getting just launched out of there and probably cooling really quickly. Um, obsidian is actually also the same, made of all the same stuff as that rhyolite and the granite, which is pretty neat. That's the place that because we start breaking the rules of mineralogy by not forming any crystals, we have a very dark looking rock, even though it's made of the material that would make those light crystals. Fascinating, Graham. Well, yeah, so I think we've, we've, what do you think, Marisa? Have we, have we covered the background of these igneous rocks? I think we've got the information we need to move on with the case, yeah. Oh, good, but the plot thickens, Gavin. Oh, it gets no. more complicated. <laughs> As it does, Graham, it's not always so cut and dry. So we talked about basalt and rhyolite, we, we talked about granite and gabbro, but there's probably stuff in the middle, huh? That's right. Geology is never as straightforward as this or that. There's often something in between. And so between um, rhyolite and basalt, there's an extrusive rock that has an intermediate composition, and that's called andesite. And what happens if we take a really long time to cool something that's made out of andesite stuff, Gavin? Well, we get the intrusive version of the andesite, that is diorite. Cool. Yeah, and you can just sort of see, right? It goes from light to darker to darkest as you go across these, yeah, these, uh, these rock types. Yeah. And so I think that even though we have some intermediate, we can still use the same sort of tools that we outlined here, the colors and the, the mineral types to figure out what we have, right, Graham? I think so, yeah. And these, these igneous rocks, you know, now that we look at them up here, they're not quite so perplexing as they were when we when we started this this adventure. I agree. So I think that we might have we might have done it. We might have done a nice thorough background check for Marisa. Do you agree, Gran? I think so. What do you think, Marisa? Just just great. Good stuff. As always. We appreciate your service, gents. Oh, thank you. It's our well, pleasure. We and we'll be happy to come back next week to go to part three of our gents rock type investigation. What's that one going to be, Gavin? Ah, it's sedimentary, my dear Watson. We're going to talk about sedimentary rocks next week. So similar to what we did today, where we talked about igneous rocks and how to identify them and how to imply a process, we're going to do the same thing to sedimentary rocks. And I'm excited because those are my favorite. Oh, I'm excited as well. It's, you know, it's contagious, your, your excitement, Gavin. I can't wait <laughs> to learn about the, the sedimentary rocks. Uh, well, you know what, uh, Jen? I actually, I've got another puzzle for you, another brief case for us to go over before we leave today, because um, we had someone send us in uh, some evidence that needs to be uh, observed. So I'm going to share it with you. Um, and we are going to um, hear the description of <clears throat> the event that took place uh, around these rocks. So what we've got here is a submission from our dear friend, Christian. Now, Christian uh, was in Monterey County and uh, noticed what he calls an amazing sheer cliff of very glossy blue, green, serpentine, serpentinite. I don't know the difference. <laughs> um, he says, as I was looking for plants, I noticed these piles of round white marbles accumulated at the bottom of the slope on top of little micro alluvial bands of scree. Uh, then I noticed there were streaks and seams and veins of them inside and among the faces of the cliffs. They felt vaguely chalky, but uh, further investigation is probably warranted. So let's take a look um, at this. We've got a couple of different pictures. So you can see as we get here, those white marbles. Mm -hmm. And then this is the, the full cliff. What do you guys see here? So, so, oh yeah, go ahead, Gav. 
Ah, thanks, Graham. Yeah. So first of all, I agree these look in place. It looks like these marbles are just popping right out of the, the rocks right underneath there. And so I would think that this, because serpentinite is, is metamorphic, this is probably, unless it's very secondary, is probably some other metamorphic mineral, right, Graham? Mm -hmm. And it's very common, you know, with serpentinite for you to have these fractures, these little cracks in it where, where like fluids, they can be waters, often salty waters with all sorts of things dissolved in them that sort of work their way um, through and break up the rock and fill in all these spaces in between the rock. And those can be any sort of, of you know, composition of materials. Sometimes they can be kind of like calcite. Sometimes they can be like, uh, like quartzy. Sometimes they can be even the, the mineral talc, which is what talcum powder is made from. And certainly, Christian, if you're thinking about heading back to investigate this more, um, especially the texture of those things, if it's something like calcite or silica, it can be, you know, when it's weathered out like this, right? This is a really well weathered um, part of the rock. It's really had the, the, the heck kicked out of it by the, the elements here. Um, but if it's talc that's making up those, you should be able to rub it and it'll feel greasy or like soapy water if you rub that, the dust of that mineral in between your fingers. Mm -hmm. so that can help you, you know, weed that out or, or confirm it as a mineral. Um, yeah, what else do you think, Gav? Yeah, certainly if you said chalky, maybe he's actually thinking like some something glossy a little bit. Talc can weather kind of very mm -hmm. distinctly. So um, yeah, I would, I would encourage Christian to feel it. Let us know if it's a greasy feeling, then it's probably talc that fits all of the criteria and it and we would expect talc in a place like this but if not it could be you know a, a different secondary mineral like grant mentioned like a calcite or something that also or calcite or quartz that also fills cracks like that but yeah i think the i think the guest talc is a good one great and so the um what we're seeing here are these outcrops and then these cracks as you're describing them between and so those cracks are also serpentinite um two or yeah so it looks like what we serpentinite is very fibrous and it weathers really uh just not distinctly but it, it has the propensity to weather very quickly and so what you probably have here is places where the serpentinite is sort of same uh sort of really weathered or not really weathered so all the places in between are probably where it's really really weathered out you agree yeah. Grant? And, and I think, you know, a lot of times, a lot of places along the coast of California, we've got lots of faulting going on here. So it could be that there's places where the rock has been faulted, it's been grinding against, and so it sort of chews it up a little bit. And so sometimes you've got spots that are, that are more easily weathered because they've got cracks in them. And often those places that are, start out with cracks in them are places that get bigger cracks in them. So if you've got a place where like fluids are concentrating and making all these veins, those are gonna be the places where it's probably gonna, you know, give way to faulting a little bit more. And then waters are gonna get in there and turn it into this more, you know, mucky, crumbly um, soil-like stuff more quickly than some of the rock around it. And right. this is also looking like in this picture right here that this this is just erosion of that rock mm -hmm. um, now. So while some other weathering had happened, maybe while that possibly talc was forming in there, um, that's still more or less in place, but then that rock continues to be weathered and erodes. And so what we have here is new sediment. Yep, this is sediment coming off the face. So Yep, the rock of yesterday is the, the soil of tomorrow. <laughs> That's poetic, Graham. Yeah, geologists call this scree. Stuff, little little pieces that come off a, a face or an outcrop, yeah. Perfect, perfect. Um, and uh, I have a question about igneous rocks for nice. you all too. Um, so what kind of igneous rocks are we likely to see around Santa Cruz. As far as I know, we don't have the only volcanoes we have in Santa Cruz are the ones that are behind you in your uh, homes right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there are there's there are 
volcanic rocks and igneous rocks in California. Um, not a ton that I know about super close to Santa Cruz. There are some ash beds that show up in the sedimentary rocks here in Santa Cruz. So that's kind of as close as we get. We call them tephra. So when a volcano erupted somewhere else in you know, ancient California, all that ash and dust rains down and makes some layers in the in things like the Parisima formation and um, and those rocks around here. But there are some really iconic volcanoes. Um, there are some vol uh, volcano fields down in Southern California. Um, Northern California has some as you know Mount Shasta, which is a very famous um, large volcano. Um, and let's never forget uh, the Sierra Nevada, which are a massive. Uh, magma chamber. Are there other ones, Gavin? Well, we also have mostly metamorphic rocks, but similar metamorphic igneous flavor up in the Santa Cruz Mountains as well, which is all like um, the coastal ranges are where you can find your serpentinites and, you know, that's right. And, sometimes. And, and serpentinites, what do those start out as almost always? Basalt. So, yeah, you probably. You could probably find both basalt and serpentinite up in the Santa Cruz Mountains as well. Cool, it comes full circle. I love it. Yeah. Um, okay, gents. Well, this has been uh, great as always, and I look forward to seeing you next week to dig into sedimentary rocks. And um, again, for everyone joining us from home, if you have rocks that you would like ID, feel free to send in pictures. You can leave them in the Facebook event. You can send them to my email. You can send them to events at santacruzmuseum.org. Um, and we'll see you again next week. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.